I'm sure that many of you have noticed that music is starting to sound more and more the same. Sometimes I have a hard time telling the difference between different artists. As a music producer and mixer who started in the 70s completely in analog and worked my way through every evolution of digital recording and mixing, I've been a witness to the changes in technology and the music business that has led to music losing its uniqueness. Some of the things I'm going to talk about you may have heard of before, but I've got a different perspective and different reasons why they have contributed to the Soundalike Syndrome. It used to be that everything you heard on a song, every instrument, every vocal was recorded with a microphone, which meant that all the sound went through the air. And what that means is that air can introduce an infinite amount of variations into the sound because the sound will change based on the atmospheric pressure, the temperature, the humidity. And yes, it's a small amount, but when you add it all up, it's a cumulative effect. If you consider all the microphones used on one session compared to another session that was recorded at a different studio with different conditions. There's also just something about air, sound going through air, and it's what gives us life. It's what we breathe and consider that a lot of the songs you're hearing today, the only thing that is being recorded with a microphone and is going through the air is the voice. Everything else goes through a wire. There's also a huge difference in where you put the microphones. It's going to sound different if it's here or here or here or angled. It's an infinite amount of variations. Now, I know that some of the plugins that people are using on their digital audio workstations on their computers, they allow you to kind of move the mic in the plugin, but they can't account for all the variations in distance and angle because most of the plugins either allow you to put it straight on like this or at a 45 degree angle. And even though some plugins allow more variation in the angle of the microphone, like these Universal Audio plugins, which are actually pretty awesome, there still seems to be limitations on where I can move the microphones. And I've yet to find an amp modeling plugin that incorporates using a microphone on the rear of the amplifier, which is something I like to do a lot. Not to mention that no two mics of the same model are going to sound exactly the same. This mic is going to sound different than this mic, which is going to sound different than this mic, which introduces more variations into the different recordings that different people are making. Back in the old days of recording, or should I say, back when I was a youngster, we would walk barefoot 10 miles through the snow carrying our amplifiers on our back. But seriously, back in the old days of recording, when you would record a song, every recording was pretty much recorded from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. You might punch in, which is where you start recording partway through the song, but every section of the song for every instrument and every vocal was a unique performance. But today... When somebody's recording their vocals, especially a chorus, what they'll do is they'll do all the different parts and then they'll copy it and then paste it into all the other courses. So you have this exact copy of every course. They're all exactly the same, but they'll also do that with the music. After they record their verses and choruses, they'll typically copy the verses and the choruses into the different places of the song, so the same exact part. Now, you might be wondering, what difference is that going to make? Because it's like program music and, you know, it's going to sound the same anyway. But what I've seen is they're actually doing this with live music, with actual bands, which seems kind of crazy to me because it's just the same performance. Every verse and every course is the same. The records that we all love from old times... They grew. The second verse was a little bit different than the first verse. The last chorus was always this bigger chorus. And now what you end up having is the song sounds just like itself in every other part of the song. And although it might not make it sound exactly like another song just because you're cutting and pacing parts in it, what it's doing is making it sound like every other song in that they just don't change. There's no growth. There's no emotional dynamics. Oh, I just wanted to add something here real quick. Please don't rip me to shreds in the comments until you watch the full video. A lot of the things I'm saying here are going to lead up to my main point at the end of the video. And if you get there and you still don't like what I said, or you thought I got something wrong, or I missed something, then you can rip me to shreds in the comments. A lot of people have pointed at the creation of drum machines as the beginning of this trend, but I disagree. The early drum machines were not actually that accurate. Some of the earliest ones were actually analog devices. This is my beloved MPC, which I used for years. And the thing that's interesting about this machine in particular is that the quantization inside of this thing, quantization is the thing that when you're playing the pads and making a beat, it lines it up to make it more in time. The quantization on these things was never accurate. It kind of drifted. It never was the same thing twice. It actually kind of had its own feel. Another thing you got to understand about a lot of these drum machines is that they're not just drum machines, they're actually samplers. You can record audio into it, 
and cut it up and then assign it to pads and play it. And while a lot of these did come with stock sounds, most of the people I know didn't use those. They would sample albums and records. Everybody that came in had their own unique drum sounds. Little John, Collie Park, David Banner, none of these guys I worked with had the same drum sounds. They had their own secret drum library. Today, most young producers are not using external drum machines. Now, they might have a controller pad, but that controller pad is controlling a plugin that is in their digital audio workstation. And while these plugins often have quantizing schemes that are supposed to emulate the feel of these different drum machines, most people are not using them. They're just playing the part in and then doing a strict 100% quantize and everything is right on the grid. I personally know this because I can tell you for a fact in the last 10 years, I've not had one project come in here that had programmed drums that weren't perfectly in time. The other thing is nobody's really creating their own sounds. These plugins come with preset sample packs and they're going out and buying sample packs, but they're all buying the same ones that everybody else has. Nobody's creating their own samples anymore. Another thing is, is that if you're listening to classic records all the way up into the 90s, you'll hear that the timing and the tempo is not always perfectly the same. You'll hear them speed up a little bit, they'll slow down, especially a big dramatic section going into a chorus, and that was defined by the drummer and the rhythm section. And you would only use a click track if your drummer was terrible. And a click track, for those who don't know, is just basically a sound that plays in the drummer's headphone to keep them on time. And sometimes you would use one if later on they were gonna add maybe a sequenced part to it or something like that. But strangely enough, over time, people started using click tracks just as a matter of course. Like, oh, we just gotta work with a click track. Me personally, I try to use one as little as possible. But here's the crazy thing. A band will go in the studio, their drummer will play to a click track, and then even after he plays with a click track, they still use Beat Detective, which is software that cuts up all the drum parts and puts them right on the grid with the song. To me, it's kind of like, what's the point of having a live drummer if you're just gonna like click track it and Beat Detective, but everybody does it now. And they're also using computer software to line up vocals. See, on a record, you'll often have several people singing along with each other, or maybe the same person will double themselves on a different track and stack the vocals. If you listen to a Beatles record, for example, you'll hear Paul McCartney and John Lennon singing together at the same time. And because they have different ways of phrasing their vocals, it's not always perfectly together, but it's a kind of a cool sound. Nowadays, they use this thing called Vocal Align, and I would demonstrate it for you, except that I don't own it anymore because I don't use it. But here's a picture of it. Now, what it does is it analyzes your lead or guide vocal and then takes your overdub vocal, which could be a double or a background vocal, and it squishes it, stretches it, and mashes it around till it matches up with the guide vocal. And people are doing similar things with basically all the instruments in the song. So we end up with this music that is perfect and exactly on beat, but devoid of all emotion and feel and humanity. I'm sure most of you know what autotune is and have seen it at work, but for those of you who haven't, I'm gonna do a quick demonstration and then I'll move on to my main points. Now, I don't actually own autotune because I don't use it, but I found something here the idea originally was just to kind of help tune the vocals a little bit. So you'd normally have the speed down here, which is how fast it tunes, and the depth a little bit lower. Uh, you can hear it in there a little bit, just barely tuning it. But what people would do, there's a setting in here called the share setting. People would do the speed as fast as it would go and put the depth as much as it would go so that you'd get this effect. Uh, You've all heard that before. Uh, kind of silly sounding, but the problem I have with it, here, let me turn this off, this is driving me nuts, is that it just makes everybody sound the same. The uniqueness of any one singer kind of gets lost with this thing on there. We all start sounding the same. And that is where most people usually stop talking about tuning, but to me, there's a lot more to it, and in a way, a bigger impact of tuning. Take the guitar, for instance. No matter how well I've got it in tune, a G chord sounds pretty good. If I go to another chord, it's mostly there. A couple notes are slightly out. If I go here, it's all right. But if I check it with a tuner, a couple notes are gonna be slightly out because it's just the nature of the instrument. It's an acoustic instrument. It's not gonna be in tune equally all around the neck. And that's true for all acoustic instruments because they're basically analog instruments. 
In the old days, when people would make records, nobody would be totally in tune, right? They didn't even have all the tuners that people have nowadays. You might have one tuner, or maybe somebody would hit a C or an E on the piano, and everybody would tune to the piano. Who knows how well that piano was in tune with a standard A440? Even old analog synthesizers like this would never stay in tune perfectly. The point is that each analog instrument could only be so in tune even with itself. And then they would kind of listen to each other and kind of adjust their individual instruments to be in tune with each other. And I have something what I called relative tuning or, or average tuning would probably be a better term. And what that means is that, whereas in modern music today, if you have a software acoustic guitar, something that mimics them, as you move around and play the different chords, they're all perfectly in tune. With modern music, here's a note, here's a note, and here's a note. And that space in between, nothing occupies it. The guitar, the bass, the keyboards, whatever, they're all here on these different notes. But in old music, maybe on the electric guitar, the acoustic guitar, the E would be here, but on the piano, the E's kind of over here, and the bass guitar down below, a octave down, it's kind of over here, and the organ, it's they're all slightly around the center of each note. So each note becomes a bigger thing. So instead of like note, 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 with old music, you had like note, 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 and it filled up more space. So it not only made it sound bigger, but every recording was a unique sound. And here's another thing. Today, when we're mixing down songs, and mixing down is where you take all the different elements, all the tracks, all the instruments, and you combine them down to a stereo file, which is left and right, which is what you're listening to on your phone, or on Spotify, or on YouTube for the most part. When that's done, it's done in the computer. Back in the old days, we mixed down to reel-to-reels. There were a lot of different brands of these things, and being analog, no two of these machines sounded the same. The other thing that would make a difference in the sound is the type of tape that they used. I like to use Ampex 456, which is more of a rock and roll type sound. Another thing that would make a difference is the tape speed. This machine ran at 15 inches per second. Some people would run at 30 inches per second. Some people would be at seven and a half inches per second, and that would change the sound. There are so many more variations that would affect the sound of your music going down to your reel to reel, and then you would take this to the mastering facility, which would make a master disc to print your records. But what would happen sometimes is that they would change the speed of the two track. This was something that sometimes was called sweetening, and they would do that because it would kind of tighten up the sound it would raise the pitch a little bit. It kind of gave it a, a brighter tone a little bit and gave it a sound like this. That's normal speed. I'm just going to speed it up. Now you see the pitch has gone up a little bit. It tightens up the song. The other thing that it does is it'll make the song a little bit shorter. So sometimes record labels would say, oh, I want the song just to be a little bit shorter to make it a little bit more competitive. So what would end up happening is that you would end up having songs on the radio where different songs didn't have the same bass tuning. They weren't tuned to A440, so you could have songs that were maybe a little higher or a little bit lower. I should probably talk about the loudness wars. Radio has always been a competitive market, going back to its beginning. You wanted your songs to be louder than other people's songs so they would stand out on the radio and capture attention more. But there was a limit to how loud that could be. With vinyl records, the mere physicality of how they work is such that there's these little teeny grooves in here that the needle sits in, and the sound is created by basically little bumps in there. And for it to be louder, the bumps have to be bigger. If they got too big, it would literally cause the needle to jump out of the groove. Now, they could control that a little bit when they were taking their reel-to-reel -reel masters and making their vinyl masters by using these things called compressors. And a compressor is basically an inverse volume control, so that as a sound got louder, if there's a little peak in the sound, it would kind of push down a little. And they could do it a little bit, but there was a limitation to what they could do. However, as we got into the late 80s and digital technology and CDs became more prevalent, there are ways to push that volume up even more. And as we got into the 90s and the 2000s, records kept getting louder and louder. Let me show you an example. I picked songs I like from four different albums. Let It Be from the Beatles' 1970 album Let It Be, Elton John's Island Girl from the K-Tel Hit Machine compilation album that was put out in 1976, Masquerade by George Benson from his 1976 album Breezin', and I Wanna Be Your Lover by Prince from his 1979 album Prince.
and I recorded them all in so that you could see the waveforms. As you can see on Let It Be right here, there's a lot of dynamic range. It starts quiet, it gets loud, and you can also see these little peaks here. These are like drum hits, like the kick drum and the snare drum. It looks very musical. We come over to Island Girl by Elton John. It's getting a little bit louder, but there's still a lot of dynamics in here. And you can also see these individual drum hits. There's an overall difference in volume between here and here, and it's going up and down. It's got some dynamics on it. Then we come over to George Benson's Masquerade, and it's definitely got a lot of dynamics. And then we go to Princess, I Want to Be Your Lover. Definitely it's starting to flatten out a little bit, but not really that much. And you can see all these individual peaks right here, which is what music with drums should look like. Now let's jump up to 1997's Semi-Charmed Life by Third Eye Blind. And you can see that's definitely getting a little louder here. Nothing crazy. I mean, I don't really see any brick walling, which is from the use of limiters. And a limiter is different from a compressor in that a compressor pushes back the volume by kind of turning it down as if you had a knob, whereas a limiter is like this thing. The volume hits it and it's not going to go above it. Now we're going to jump up to Unthinkable by Alicia Keys. Now look at this. You can definitely see how it's getting louder there. And you can start seeing the disappearance of any kind of dynamics in individual peaks from, you know, one drum hit or some instrument that's slightly louder. Now we're going to jump up to 2024's Texas Hold'em. Boom! Look at the volume difference here. And you can see that it's definitely brick wall. This is clipping here, folks. Look at that. It's just like there's no dynamics left anymore. And the individuality of different parts in the song is kind of disappearing. It's just loud. But this is where we're at now. If you see where music was back in the late 60s, early 70s, up to now, and the volume difference. And what that means is that it's just loud all the time. There's no dynamics. Nowadays, instead of hearing a song that might louder and quiet and have these little sections you gotta listen for it. It's all just in your face. Everything is loud. I had all these other things I was gonna talk about in this video, such as the death of indie radio and the consolidation of massive radio station networks and their use of central programming, how the music business used to be run by people who had some sort of musical expertise or at least music enthusiasm, to being run by soulless lawyers and musically ignorant money-grubbing pigs, the death of genres, which might be a whole video in itself, getting more and more songs to mix that are all at 120 beats per minute. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. The decrease in the percentage of songs that use key changes, MIDI packs, and the death of the full-length album, the album cut and how everything's a single now, but the video is just getting too damn long and I thought I should just focus on my area of expertise. So here we go with my main point. I mostly work with young artists and producers who are making their music in computers using all the software that I'm talking about. And I actually like the stuff that they make. I think it's pretty damn cool. And they're all in the business. They're working at studios. They're producing people. They're doing major label work. They're talking to record labels, trying to get their careers ahead and get a deal. But I often hear some of them say, oh, well, I played them my stuff. And they said, oh, I just sound too much like somebody else, or it doesn't sound different enough. And I'm thinking like, well, I don't know. I think it sounds pretty cool to me. And then I went to this thing called a plug and play. And a plug and play is where young artists and producers will go somewhere and they get a chance to play one of their songs in front of everybody else and in front of music industry professionals to try to get some advice and maybe get a deal or something like that. And I'm listening to it and it all sounded pretty good. But after a minute, I'm like, it all sounds exactly the same. Like literally exactly the same. The same tempos, the same drum beats. The instruments sound the same. It seemed like all the keys were kind of the same. And I'm talking to some of the people there and asking them how they make their music. And they're all like, oh, well, we download stuff from this website where I can get loops and all that. And I know what websites they're talking about. And then it kind of hit me. They're all using the same instruments and the same gear and kind of the same musicians. Like it's, they're using the same things. I mean, let me show you what I'm talking about. One of the biggest advances in music production technology is emulation or modeling software. And that is where they can take a real piece of hardware, a mic preamplifier, an EQ or a guitar amp, or even a microphone and copy that sound so you can put it in your computer. For instance, here, and I'm using Universal Audio plugins. There is a model here of the Teletronics LA-2A when some of these originals aren't even made anymore. And these are pretty accurate. There's also the Helios EQ and Mic Pre, which is amazing. And what's cool about this particular setup, if I hit this button right here, I can record through this stuff. I mean, it's literally as if the piece of gear is sitting here and I'm recording through it into my digital audio workstation on my computer. There's this right here, the model of the Neve 1073 mic pre and EQ. 
And I got to tell you, it does that little thing where if I just barely hit the treble here, it does this little sizzle and it's amazing. And then there's things like this, this Fairchild 660 and analog reel-to-reel tape emulators. And here's a crazy thing. They've even got mic modeling software. And it's a godsend because how else would you get this gear? But here's the thing. If you go to a studio to record your band and they've got a rack of Neve 1073 mic pre's, no two of those mic pre's are going to sound exactly like each other. And if you go to somebody else's studio and they've got Neve 1073 mic pre's, they're not going to sound the same either. If you come to my studio, I might pull out this Neumann U87, which this one is a magic U87. It sounds like no other U87 I've ever heard, which by the way, this was given to me by Marshall Cease, AKA the Tin Man. Thank you very much. Also, I've got three of these distressor compressors and the one on top for some reason just sounds better to me. Whereas the one on the bottom, the gain is always a little different than the other ones, which affects the way it sounds. Which is why songs that are recorded using outboard gear, their own microphones, their own instruments, amplifiers, and in their own rooms. My, I hadn't even talked about how rooms sound different. That's why they all sound unique. And even though these plugins sound great and help us get the work done, it's almost as if there's only one mic pre that we all share. When you're done with it, some guy comes and picks it up. Microphones, he grabs that too. There's only one Roland Juno 106 out there, and when you're done with it, the next guy's got to get it. And there's only one Black Beauty snare drum that we all use, and this one acoustic guitar that we all share. Now, I'm not saying that this software is bad or that you shouldn't use it. I use it all the time. I would just like to encourage people to try something different. Get out of the box. And you don't really need all the equipment that I've got here to accomplish that. If anybody's interested in me doing a video about that, I've got some interesting techniques, let me know. In the meantime, thanks for watching and always be unique.